Welcome very much to um, this TRI CSIRO collaborative event. <clears throat> I think that it might be a select group today, given that uh, respiratory viruses appear to be causing all sorts of trouble all over the place, but I welcome everybody who is in person today in the auditorium. And then we have a number of participants who are online. And we also have some of our um, speakers and my co-chair who is also online. So I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians um, of country throughout Australia. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present. And so I hope that everybody has started to um, see the uh, collaborative uh, research grant opportunity that TRI and CSIRO have come together um, for. So we have um, the Australian eHealth Research Centre um, from CSIRO who have joined with TRI to um, bring researchers, clinicians, and of course the members from um, uh, the eHealth CSIRO group to try and tackle and ultimately solve, but tackle a healthcare challenge. So that's a very broad um, possibility for everyone in the audience and those beyond to have a think about today. But the aim of today was really to hear from um, the groups. Um, we're very grateful for those that have come over and those online today from the um, from CSIRO to give us an overview of the sort of work um, uh, that these teams are undertaking and the sorts of collaborations that therefore might be possible for members of TRI and also clinicians. So I'd like to introduce David Hansen, um, who is online um, for us today. He's the CEO and the research director um, at the Australian eHealth Research Centre at CSIRO. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, and um, I'll just start by acknowledging the traditional lands, uh, to, by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on today, and here in Brisbane, it is the Tuggera and Yorubal people. Okay, thank you um, very much, Helen, for that introduction. Um, and look, it's great to uh, be talking to you all today. I'm very sorry I'm not at the TRI in person. It's um, a fabulous building, and we've used the, the um, uh, the, the auditorium there on occasion over the last uh, few years and obviously not over the last two years but previously and um, and, and um, you know we've um, obviously being here and uh, centered here in Brisbane uh, we've done a lot of work with people who are at the TRI so this is a great opportunity I think to um, uh, turbocharge some of that to look at, at where we can open up some new opportunities to work together um, we do work with the members of the TRI, UQ and QUT, um, uh, MARTA and, and um, uh, Metro South and Queensland Health, but um, always looking for new opportunities to, uh, to work with great uh, researchers. So I've got a short presentation today just to introduce you to, um, to what we do. And um, I'm just sharing my screen now. Um, uh, and um, and then we've got five presentations from from scientists across the the research centre. And so um, so as as uh, mentioned, I lead uh, CSIRO Australian Health Research Centre. Um, we are CSIRO's national digital health research program. Um, we've got a very proud history here in Queensland because we did we we started. In fact, um, the 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 centre started as a joint venture between CSIRO and Queensland Health back in two thousand and three. So um, uh, we've, we've been around a while, and we've really grown from you know five or six people when I joined in two thousand and four, coming back from working in a bioinformatics company in the UK and for the European Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, when I came back to Australia to join in 2004, there was probably 10 of us and uh, we've grown to be 100 scientists and engineers and, and 30 students in Brisbane, Perth, Sydney and Melbourne. Um, we outgrew our, our original, a couple of our, 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 um, our office spaces and so we're now based in the new STARS building on the top floor and very welcome to um, have visitors if you'd like to come over and chat. Uh, I guess the aim of the program, so, so as well as being, I should mention that as well as being CSO's National Digital Health Program and, and, and the joint venture with Queensland Health, which continues, um, we are part of CSO's Health and Biosecurity Business Unit, 
and uh, and we work broadly across across CSIRO. So when you do work with us, uh, it is working with CSIRO, and we can access researchers um, and facilities right across Australia through the through CSIRO. Uh, this morning, I was talking to people down in the Australian um, Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness, which used to be called the Australian Animal Health Laboratory, down in Geelong, who have a, a PCP4 uh, lab, um, one of the, uh, one of the big ones and one of the most important ones around the world that's been doing work um, with a, uh, with a bunch of infectious diseases, for instance. Um, uh, but but here we're to, here to talk about what we do in health. Um, we are, I, I think we're still the largest digital health research program uh, in Australia and we work right from uh, cells through to uh, communities and so, uh, and society. Um, so a couple of examples of, of some of the things we've done. Um, uh, Michael, who's online, um, uh, like me, uh, um, I'm no longer isolating, but um, I'm day eight or nine of, of my COVID infection, so not in, not visiting TRI. Um, and so Michael's online with me for a similar reason. Um, he leads our health informatics group and some of the work that he does and his group does around clinical terminology services are used um, here in Australia, but by health services around the world. So that's, that's one where these are some of our success stories. Um, our machine learning genomic sequence analysis tool, Variant Spark, uh, is on the AWS marketplace and, and um, Priya will be talking about some of our genomics work. Um, <coughs> we, we actually led with Metro North actually, um, but we're doing work with Metro South now uh, around mobile health. Um, and, the, and, and we did with the Prince Charles Hospital and Metro North HHS way back in 2011, 12, uh, a first clinically validated um, mobile app for cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, and we spun that out as a company called Cardihab. Um, and, and some of our virtual care work goes right into, um, into the community. So um, our Smarter Safer Homes work, for instance, uses um, data from sensors to um, uh, to help people live, uh, to help aged Australians live in their in their homes for longer, and provide information to service providers on um, on how those people are going. Um, so we like to say that we do science with impact, and as I mentioned, we go from oops, sorry, uh, uh, we go from science to uh, we go from cells to society. Um, so. Uh, we work in three broad areas and they are broad. So biomedical informatics, um, so biostatistics bio imaging and genomics based clinical workflows. And Jürgen's are gonna be talking about some of our imaging work today and, and Priya will be talking about some of our genomics work. Our health informatics group, I've already mentioned about improving health system performance and productivity from um, electronic health data. And Michael will be talking about some of that work. Uh, today and Sankalp will also be talking about some of the uh, predictive analytics and risk analytics work that we do in that area as well. And then health services, improving access to services and management of chronic diseases. We've got Kaylee here today um, talking about some of the work that goes on in our health services uh, area of research. I wanted to mention um, that we're really, uh, we see four or five big trends. I'll say four now and on the next slide, I'll add a fifth uh, uh, in health IT or, or digital health. Uh, and they are interoperability, cloud, apps and personalization and data analytics as a service. Um, and so some of the work which, um, which Michael's uh, doing at the moment and we'll be talking about is, is around that key interoperability of um, enabling data to flow between uh, computer systems to follow the patient um, <coughs> and make sure that that data is, um, is, is, has, is able to be used and is able to be shared safely. And this is very much around providing connected care. So we're all, we all know about the electronic medical records that hospitals are putting in. Um, we have pathology reports and, and um, uh, radiology reports and, and discharge summaries and all this. And, and then when you go to see the GP, they take notes in a different system. So all of that, that data does need to uh, follow the patient from 
uh, across the across the patient journey, and that's where the interoperability of the system uh, of these digital systems comes in. So, uh, so it's really important. Um, but that that's not just important for that interoperability. It lays a, it lays a real foundation for everything that we might do in the healthcare system in the future, which will increasingly depend on data to drive decision making and support um, support patient care. Um, Another big trend is cloud, um, and this is around, again around data moving around the system. But cloud's also important because it um, it enables uh, data to be um, uh, stored, shared, uh, but with access to large compute as well. And that's where some of the big computing uh, challenges in in uh, genomics and imaging, as well as just big patient data, um, will really need to operate on big compute. Uh, apps and personalization, whether that's apps on our phone or um, apps in electronic medical record and personalization, taking into account um, uh, personal and, and precision health um, data uh, is going to be increasingly important to make sure that we do treat the patient as, as, as much as we can. And then data analytics as a service where instead of um, sending data off to be to be analysed, um, we actually bring data analytics to the data. And, and again, that comes back to cloud and interoperability where we need the data to be standardised um, and available. And then you can, and you don't have to share your data broadly, you can actually bring data analytics services to the data. Uh, I wanted to mention that um, uh, Australia is not doing too bad, but, but we're um, a little bit behind what's happening in the US in, in some of these uh, areas and so in the US now if you uh, go to a hospital which is a Cerner hospital um, you can connect your iPhone directly to that um, to that Cerner instance and, and download your health record onto your phone uh, and this is that that whole uh, uh, inter that that whole connection depends on interoperability cloud apps and personalization and data analytics as the services to work uh, the standardization part of that interoperability uh, is exactly what we're grappling with here in Australia and in fact the the standard that they use in America was developed here in Australia first and we haven't quite kept up with how America uh, are using it so um, lots of things that we can do in the future the fifth area I promised was that, of course, um, uh, what we hear a lot about in healthcare is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so um, we think that all of the four things above um, will really be really support us to be able to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. Uh, and so across the five talks today that you'll hear, you'll hear, they might not say it explicitly, but implicitly there's this idea of interoperability and, and cloud and, and big compute, really supporting artificial intelligence um, and machine learning uh, um, use in, in what we're delivering in digital health. Um, I did want to mention then, if, if we're talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare, that uh, two years ago now, this was our first COVID project. Um, we started it before COVID, but um, being stuck at home in, in uh, the first half of 2020 enabled us to really drive the um, uh, getting this document out. Uh, it is a, it's called Exemplars of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in Healthcare. It's downloadable from our website. The URL there, um, and and really AI and machine learning in healthcare. At the time, there were a lot of reports coming out about AI and machine learning in healthcare, and we we wanted to, you know, if everyone else I guess had a report, we thought we should too, and so um, we published this. It's uh, there's a, a primer about artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, what, what the technologies em, uh, embrace, um, and then 34 case studies of how we use AI and machine learning in healthcare across data-driven intelligence, imaging and vision, vision knowledge representation and reason, reasoning and human understanding. Um, and so some of those, um, uh, include machine learning on retinal images to enable telehealth screening for eye diseases, uh, cloud computing and random forest to analyze whole genome sequence collections, um, description logic to organize health data with terminologies such as SNOMED CT and enable smart data analytics, 
Machine learning to understand movement patterns of aged Australians living alone, alerting carers if functional independence declines over time. Deep learning to analyze brain images, extract disease biomarkers for diseases such as Alzheimer's and cerebral palsy. Or natural language processing to extract information from medical narratives, um, such as histopathology reports and to, uh, to inform cancer registries. So I think that's where I'll finish today. Um, and uh, I will stop sharing that. So thank you. Um, thank you for having us. Um, I will stop sharing. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for coming along and, and, and listening. As Helen mentioned, we do have some grants there. It'd be great to um, talk about how we can. Um, uh, it'd be great if uh, after today, we've got a panel at the end. Um, it'd be great to reach out to us or, or we'll continue to reach out to our, uh, the people we know there, but it'd be great to find some great grants that, that would kick off some um, bigger work between CSRO and those at the Translational Research Institute. Okay, thank you. First up, so as I mentioned, we've got um, five speakers today. And so the first speaker today is, uh, is Sankalp. Um, so Sankalp leads our health intelligence uh, team um, I'm going to be introducing each of the speakers, but I don't think we're going to turn my video back on um, <coughs> and just to, to save a bit of um, uh, time. And, um, and so, as I mentioned, Soundcalp leads our, um, our health intelligence team and will be talking about real-time decision support for transforming healthcare. So over to you, Soundcalp. Thanks, David. Um, so um, really, um, like David said, I'm from the health system analytics group and our work's primarily been focused over the last nearly two decades on looking at using data that's collected in the health system routinely, initially to inform health system productivity and efficiency. So to identify bottlenecks in flow and see how we can provide various types of predictive models and simulation models around what if scenario planning and surveillance models to try and do easy outbreak detection and stuff like that and optimization of of uh, resources um, more recently as um, clinical data has been collected in the health system and that project actually started here with PA hospital to look at collecting vital signs and all of that information that's in the system to try and predict um, patient risk either of um, rehospitalization or of deterioration while they're an inpatient. And I'll give, I'm really going to focus on two examples of work in that space today. Um, and the focus there is again on that explainable machine learning to try and provide uh, clinicians with information that they can trust and use. And uh, we've got a second team in the group that works looking at evidence-based healthcare delivery. So evaluating models of care and understanding the drivers of evidence-based practice to, and that's an area of implementation science. So we do a lot of work in that space. Um, the agenda along that clinical decision support um, is to develop high performing explainable machine learning models with a sense of um, if we're going to predict um, a patient risk of something uh, to also then provide clinicians with a sense of why a model is identifying a patient as high risk so or of uh, at risk of either dying or of deteriorating or something like that um, and there's sort of various approaches that we um, employ for that and the three applications are either trying to identify uh, patient cohorts that might be of interest at risk of hospitalization while they're in primary care or at risk of deteriorating in some form um, and the third point is to look at um, that precision decision support at the point of care uh, to, uh, to then try and see if we can inform um, the care planning for these patients. So that's the sort of work that we have been focusing a lot on. I'll give you two examples of that. Um, um, this is work we, and these are both examples of work done with Metro South. Um, we, um, I think about 10, 12 years ago, started looking at with data that's collected in the non-digital system around trying to predict patient risk of um, 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 readmission following um, discharge. So coming back within 30 days, um, we've sort of developed those algorithms, uh, trialed them at Logan Hospital um, uh, for about uh, 24 months. Uh, we've then, um, for Queensland Health, redeveloped these on statewide data. And they're currently, um, they've been delivered last year and they're looking at how they can deploy that at a statewide level. Um, 
the algorithms employ uh, an explainable machine learning approach. Um, so for example, if you've got two people that are predicted as having the same risk, um, looking at the explainability module, a clinician might find that one patient's being predicted as being high risk because they are um, 80 years of age, whereas another patient, um, but they might otherwise be healthy, whereas another patient might be uh, predicted as being high risk because um, they are 40 years of age, but they are, um, they've got multiple comorbidities and they've got diabetes. So the patient, uh, the clinician can then plan interventions for them out of hospital differently, knowing what that risk is. We are also, like David mentioned, interoperability. We are also working at developing a standards-based model uh, for uh, this algorithm so that it can be deployed at scale and you don't have to redevelop it every time you go to a new hospital and you're trying to map to how that hospital captures data. Um, the second example is um, more recent work we've done um, initially with data from PA Hospital, but we are now working on uh, collecting data from Logan Hospital to do some work in this space. And this was to try and look at data that's collected in the IEMR system to uh, predict using not just demographic information and medical history, but also vital signs that are being collected in the system to try and predict a patient risk of deterioration. Now, we initially defined this as um, uh, having a patient having a cardiac arrest or dying or having an unplanned admission to ICU. But looking at clinical workflows and looking at the idea that um, um, there's already a between the flags type approach or a QADS approach that's employed for managing these patients. We took, and this is work um, that um, David Cook at PA has been sort of leading clinically. Um, we looked at the idea of why don't we try and predict the alert before it happens so that if we can identify that patient being at risk two to eight hours before the alert actually triggers, we give the clinical teams a few extra hours to actually intervene and, and manage that patient. And that paper has just been published actually, I think day before yesterday in Nature Scientific Reports. Um, and there's a link that I think we're sharing these slides. Um, and the model actually has really great discrimination and calibration. Uh, it was initially built for between the flags, but we are now um, collecting data to actually test it on the QADs. And there should be some publication in that space soon. And we are also using similar approaches, for example, with Westmead um, in New South Wales to predict deterioration in extremely premature infants. Um, and we are hoping to start a trial uh, probably at QE2 hospital very soon uh, of this algorithm to see how it works in clinical practice. So that's just a little bit of um, examples of the kind of clinical decision support uh, work we've been doing. Um, so if you've got um, interesting problems that you'd like to build either statistical models or prediction models around um, to sort of inform uh, clinical workflows, I'd be very happy to have a chat and talk more about it. David's already shared that report, but there's some examples in that report for you to look at. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sankal. <coughs> um, thank you, Sankal. Um, so next up, uh, we actually have Michael, uh, who is uh, like me, <laughs> not in the not in the auditorium today. So Michael um, and and Sankup was a, a little quick, so you've got a few extra minutes there to 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 play with. But I'll hand over to you. So as I mentioned, Michael leads our health informatics group, dealing with all things about the standardisation and processing of clinical and health data. So I'll hand over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands we're meeting on, the Yuggera and Turrbal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and elders from other communities who may be joining us today, either in person or, like myself, online. Um, I'd like to um, give you... Uh, a brief overview of the work we do in the health informatics group. Um, we have some, um, some fairly broad goals in the health informatics group. They're all, um, I think, essentially based around um, interoperability and the use uh, of health data and ensuring that the um, investment in digital health um, from governments and um, the, the health system, both nationally and internationally, um, actually delivers value. Um, and we specifically look at improving clinical decision support, um, reporting, operational efficiency, and resource management. So we're looking at um, delivering value across a, 
a range of different areas. And our main strategy for this is to um, build platforms. Um, we, so we focus on the use of standards. Uh, the idea of using standards is to drive down the cost uh, and to build out a, um, platforms um, that provide consistent, um, high quality data. Um, and the key things that we're looking at um, in that space are in the area of clinical terminology, the SNOMED CT standard um, and HL7's fire standard. Um, we've not selected these ourselves. Um, these are you know, emergent from the, the health ecosystem. Australia invested early in SNOMED CT. Um, and as David mentioned earlier, fire was um, invented in Australia um, and has seen rapid adoption um, across the US, um, especially, uh, but also in this, um, to some extent in Australia and um, uh, in Europe. And really seeing the, the, the rate of adoption um, of a, an emerging standard um, by software vendors who see it as actually solving problems um, rather than something that's foisted upon them um, by regulators um, has, has been quite, um, quite exciting. So in terms of the group structure, um, we're actually a, a growing group and, and this slide is, is effectively old, but broadly um, our, our group is divided into teams that work with clinical terminology, um, software engineering teams that support projects across the lab, um, both within the group and across other groups. Um, and they bring expertise in things like um, um, uh, software as a medical device, um, consistency and, and um, mobile um, platforms, um, data interoperability and natural language processing and, um, and engineering um the engineering side of um, the use of, of the fire standard so really why do we care about data um we care about data because without good um information we can't deliver um i know we're delivering um high quality and safe healthcare. um it's essential for monitoring analysis and policy development. Um, and it's, it's complex data in the health space. It's not like financial data, uh, which, is, which is relatively straightforward. Um, and it is um, characterized by a lot of um, complex and detailed language and often a lot of implicit context. And so this is the challenge um, when working with uh, health record data and, and especially with um, natural language um, data is that there's a lot of implicit context and with, without software systems that can um, recognize and, um, and work with that implicit context, um, then there's the um, big opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, so really that's the sort of the driver for looking towards um, things like standardized clinical terminology and um, and and the, the selection of um, Snow CT as, as the core piece but not the only piece to support that, support that element so we look at um, different types of data we look at um, structured data um, relevant standards of course fire but also um, opening HR um, which is a, a um, similar level um, standard um, with much more adoption um, across Europe um, and is more targeted at, um, at direct use within um, EMRs, whereas fire is more targeted at exchange between systems um, and, and building an ecosystem um, of um, applications um, interoperating um, with data. And then OMOP, which is aimed at um, 
uh, the sort of analytics use case. And so it's a, a simplified data model uh, and that has a lot of um, traction because of that simplified data model. It maps into a more traditional database structure um, and the, the act of um, abstracting data from the raw clinical representation into the OMOP form, format means that the uh, reporting and analytics you do can be um, more easily standardized. Uh, but there is a lot of work involved in, in, in doing that abstraction. Um, for clinical terminology, really the key here is that the terms are computable. So it's not just standard, um, standard words or phrases, um, it's the associated relationships between them that are the key things that we work with. Uh, so SOMED provides great detail here. AMT is Australia's medicine terminology, uh, which is an extension of SNOMED. And we've worked um, hard to develop some of the technologies that are um, used to uh, reason with um, strengths and, um, and quantities within the medicine terminology. Um, ICD-10, again, for um, reporting purposes, and HPO when you move over into the, the genomic space. Um, so some, some of the key things we work with. And then other forms of data, as I mentioned, free text or natural language, um, and then extending into the genomic space. But we, over the years, have developed um, a number of um, technologies that have, um, have matured um, quite substantially, and some of those are listed here. Uh, Onto Server is our flagship product. We have um, international uh, licensing and adoption of Onto Server. Um, it is the terminology server of choice for the NHS. It's the national terminology server for um, the Netherlands. We have adoption in Germany. Um, also the um, national terminology server, of course, for Australia um, and New Zealand. Um, and then a number of um, reseller agreements that we've signed with um, or are in the process of signing um, with um, big software vendors, um, global software vendors. Um, and then building on that, we have um, tools like Snapper and Shrimp um, and Atomio. So they all support that ecosystem for interacting with the terminology. Um, and then um, a set of open source products. Um, Parsling is the um, uh, most interesting emerging technology there probably. Uh, Pathling is open source and it provides um, fire native analytics capability. So you don't have to transform the data out of the uh, fire structure into um, something that you can query with SQL, for example, but you can query it directly. Um, but Pathling also works with, um, with uh, Python now and non-fire data. So you get all the um, smart terminology capability that Pathling brings to bear from Onto Server, um, but you can, and you can apply it directly to um, simple tabular uh, clinical data through, through the Python libraries. Um, and then we have you know, a, a large number of collaborators nationally um, and globally. Um, collaborators and customers there. Now at this point, I want to focus on um, the, some of the more um, research oriented parts of, of the um, group, in particular the health tech analytics um, team. Um, this team does both natural and processing um, chatbots and search based um, capability. And there's a, a number of emerging um, technologies coming out of there. MedTech is the, the platform that um, we've been developing over the, the um, longest period. Um, it's in production um, with the Queensland Cancer Registry for processing um, the um, feed of pathology reports re in real time to populate the cancer registry. And so it's a, a real world end-to-end -end use of our um, NLP work um, to extract structured data out of 
um, free text data and, and automatically populate uh, um, the, the registry. And it works at a, a level um, um, of accuracy that um, was comparable to the, um, the human approach and sufficient to, to um, update it or replace that process and um, result in a, a registry that um, is up to date rather than um, running several years behind. Um, I'd like to finish with a, a, just a quick um, overview of a couple of key um, projects. Uh, the auto advance, that's gonna be annoying. Um, first one is um, the precision medicine search engine work that, um, in the pediatric oncology space. Um, this is work we've done with the Queensland Children's Hospital and the Queensland Children's Hospital Foundation. Uh, this project developed a search engine to help clinicians find targeted treatments for children with cancer. Um, childhood cancer is the leading cause of death and clinicians increasingly seek treatments that are tailored to an individual patient's genetics. Uh, finding treatments that are specific to paediatrics and that match an individual's genetics is a real challenge amongst the vast body of medical literature and clinical trials. We aim to help clinicians through a search system tailored to this problem. Um, and this um, system retrieves PubMed articles and clinical trials. It uses query suggestion to help clinicians formulate otherwise difficult queries. And the results are presented as a knowledge graph to help um, interpret ability. The system aims to by significantly reduce the effort of searching for targeted treatments and potentially finding life saving treatments that may have otherwise been missed. Uh, we have a successful prototype and are now looking at uh, launching a bigger project to expand this prototype into a full fledged system. Uh, the other piece of work um, is part of the broader CSI work to curb antimicrobial resistance. We're working closely with the health system to use AI and data to improve antibiotic um, stewardship. The app you see shown here aims to streamline microbiology test result reviews in an emergency department, uh, not only to improve the clinical efficiency of a labor intensive process, but also to tackle antimicrobial resistance by using IT and AI uh, intelligence to support appropriate use of antibiotics. Um, this is a, again, a digital health standards based tool. It's based on FHIR um, and it supports tracking, tracing and tackling antimicrobial resistance in the ED. It reconciles information from test results and patient discharge summaries to alert the physician of drug bug mismatches and hence when a change of antibiotic treatment might be needed. So um, provides a kind of a triaging um, capability and, and workflow. Um, so I've, I'll finish there and um, thank you for atten your attention and hand back to David. Okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> so, a real tour de force of, of um, the work that Michael's group is doing across um, across you uh, across standardising and using uh, standard health data. So great work, thanks, Michael. Um, next up, we have Priya Romaro um, Romaro Milne, and, and uh, Priya's in our um, transformational bioinformatics group. Dennis Bauer leads the group. Um, Dennis is based in Sydney. Um, <coughs> we're lucky to have Priya with us in Brisbane, uh, as well as a couple of other other team members of Dennis's. And I'm going to hand uh, and so Priya will be talking about what we're doing in genomics. Over to you, Priya. We're just uh, got a few. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, so my name is Priya, I'm a postdoc in the Transformational Bioinformatics Group, and today I'll talk to you, I thought I'd structure the talk as um, just a little bit of a case study on what we have been working on recently, and um, tie it in with how the work, uh, how the group works together as a whole and what parts, um, what sort of uh, different diseases they work on. So today I'll be talking to you about detecting genomic variations in SARS-CoV-2 virus associated with the disease outcome. 
So health organizations such as WHO and CDC um, could classify a COVID variant as a variant of concern. And quite often these variants are ones that result in increased disease severity, um, increased rate of transmission or reduction of vaccine effectiveness. And these uh, characteristics are often a result of mutations that the variant accumulates over time. Um, however, a big problem with this is that um, mutations that directly affect the characteristics of the virus may be difficult to distinguish from benign lineage defining mutations. Um, for example, most uh, lineage markers are the ones that define clades, and often the disease if impact is observed after the fact rather than um, in real time. So one, one such repository that helps with this sort of research is GISAID, um, which now contains about, I think, 11 and a half million SARS-CoV-2 genomes isolated from human hosts. So the SARS-CoV-2 genome is approximately 30,000 base pairs long. Um, however, most mutations that are monitored tend to fall within the spike region of the virus. And this is because it contains a receptor binding domain for the human ACE2 receptor. But there is increasing research showing that there might be regions outside the spike that might be important for the modulation of the viral characteristics as well. So previous studies use um, traditional methods such as logistic regression and chi-squared tests to perform association studies to identify single mutations that might be um, independently associated with disease outcome. But we propose that a machine learning approach such as random forest may identify not only these single mutations, but also interacting muta mutations that might show evidence of epistasis when correlating to the host disease outcome. So just a quick overview of the data selection from the database that we uh, picked. So as of 21st September 2021, which is when we conducted the analysis, there were around three and a half million samples. However, unfortunately, um, most of these samples had very poor clinical data annotation. Um, so we were ultimately boiled down to 10,000 um, cases, sorry, three and a half thousand cases and 7,000 controls. So we selected, we were quite stringent in the selection of cases and controls. So we picked cases that had a really severe outcome. So clinical annotations that were correlated with um, severe disease, um, critical uh, post-mortem, et cetera. And the cases that we selected had very mild clinical signs without hospitalization, um, so we are essentially doing like this association study to see which mutations uh, are involved with the outcome. So as I mentioned, only 0.3% of all samples in the database were able to be used in our analysis. And as of recently, we decided to see if this, is, this had improved. Um, however, we found that the clinical annotations um, are quite poor. So I think this is really important uh, call for better clinical data annotations and follow-up because it's such a big repository and has such a large potential, but um, most of it was not able to be used. So our current workflow for this is um, using Variant Spark, which David mentioned earlier, which is our machine learning tool, which you can find on AWS. Um, we use the random forest um, algorithm to detect mutations, which are of high importance. We perform hyperparameter tuning in variant Spark as well. And recently we've developed a method to assign p-values to our gene importance scores. And this paper is on BioArchive. Following on from this, we uh, detect higher order interactions. So interactions uh, that involve two, three, or four mutation combinations that when inherited together might correlate with patient outcome. And lastly, we pick these important mutations that, um, that come up as significant and try and predict the impact on protein structure by using AlphaFold. So this is a really big collaboration between everyone in the group and um, also um, with Dr. Michael Kuiper from Data61. So I'll just briefly go through the results of our association study. So um, Variant Spark identified novel regions with high importance scores. So after running our p-value tool, we identified 117 significant hits. And what we found really interesting was that uh, there were mutations that are not only just found in the spike region that were coming up as really significant, but also regions outside spikes, so such as NSP14, um, which are highlighted in red. Of these 117 mutations, uh, it was encouraging to see that uh, 47 of them were already currently being monitored by WHO, so we were picking up known pathogenic mutations as well. So the cluster of pathogenic mutations that we found were in NSP14, which um, was in the 3 to 5 prime ex exonuclease domain. And what we found really interesting about this um, mutation cluster was that it's adjacent to C261, which you can see in the inset um, on the slide. 
which has previously been published. Um, I think there was some functional work as well saying that the uh, mutations in C261 can uh, modulate the translation inhibition activity of the virus, which is really important. But at this point, we haven't done any functional work on our mutations yet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we found cluster of protective mutations as well in spike protein genes. And protective here just means that um, the mutations correlated with a more favorable disease outcome. Um, I won't go too much into this, but we, in terms of interacting SNVs, we found um, a lot of highly associative epistatic interactions, uh, many involving four mutations, um, which is a pretty novel result. What we found really interesting was that the interactions um, often involved a combination of protective and pathogenic uh, mutations. So this suggests that um, when you're considering mutations in isolation, you might be missing um, a lot of information um, from other variants that might be in epistasis other mutations. And these may co-evolve together. So we probably need to um, uh, consider all of these mutations in, a, in combination. So this, um, this paper was recently published. Uh, and if you want to know more about our work, you can uh, read more about it here. And the reason I picked this, um, this project is that um, it's a big collaboration between everyone in the group. Um, I'll go a little bit more into what each person does or each uh, team does a bit later on. So just to summarize the um, study, we identified novel mutations which correlate with disease outcome, including several mutations that showed evidence of epistatic interactions. And this approach does have the potential to differentiate disease affecting mutations from lineage defining mutations, which can be monitored in future variants. Um, future work, which would be ideal, but no such data set really exists at the moment. Um, that's got enough data anyway should consider patient demographics and comorbidities because it's a really big factor um, that factors into how a patient uh, responds to the virus. And what would be really interesting for future work would be to see the interactions between host genomes, say we have the host whole genome sequencing in combination with viral genomes. So we can sort of um, try and pick out the interplay between the host and viral genome. And this particular approach can represent a pipeline for genomic surveillance of any pathogen, not just COVID. So um, it's very flexible approach. So in terms of future and ongoing work in the group, um, we are currently working on um, scalable variant tracking pipeline, um, part of which is published in our paper that can automatically download, process, and identify significant SNVs and combinations and perform protein modeling in real time. So this will enable real time tracking of these um, important mutations. Um, the next thing we want to do is in vitro assays to test, to actually test the functional consequences of these mutations that we find. Um, Carol Lee in the digital genome engineering team is working on um, a really cool COVID pipeline to, to detect the spread and distribution of the mutations of interest. And it was also part of the paper that we published. Um, and this is really interesting to see how these um, pathogenic mutations are sort of making their way through the population. Lawrence is working on functional consequences of the mutations that we find. Um, so just looking at evolution and mouse ad adaptation and combinatorial effects, which is really cool as well. Um, and I thought in the last couple of minutes, I would just talk a little bit about how other members of the group are using um, this particular approach for genome-wide association studies of complex diseases. So the pipeline that I mentioned um, in before, the variant Spark and Bit Epi, was originally designed for um, genome-wide association studies. So essentially, um, we have the cases and controls, so a large population of cases and controls for a particular disease. And we run quality control in Plink, which is the traditional way, but we run our random forest algorithm to find the mutations that might correlate with the disease. So after we run variant Spark, um, we find the significant SNPs and then use bit epi to find interacting SNPs that um, might be in epistasis with each other. So within the group, um, we work on a broad range of complex diseases. So um, one of the biggest um, projects that we have going at the moment is a cardiovascular disease um, uh, variant spark project, which is led by Letitia. And this involves a big collaboration with a UK Biobank and University of Sydney. We also have uh, Misha and Letitia again working on Alzheimer's disease, and this is an ADNI cohort, um, which is really interesting as well. 
And um, at the moment, we're also working with um, Project Mind, which is an international consortium, and Macquarie University on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. So um, I haven't shown any of the data from other members of the group today, just because they're doing some papers, but watch the space for some really interesting um, results. And of course, we're always ready and willing to collaborate with any other, um, any other diseases or any other um, users for our pipeline that you could potentially think of. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone in the Transformational Bioinformatics Group, um, particularly Yatish, who is the co-lead author of the work that um, I presented today, and also um, Arash from Garvin, which is really helpful, who was really helpful with our work as well, and um, Naomi. And I'd also like to thank our collaborators, Ronin, Jazade, and Intel, and thank you all for listening. Fabulous. <laughs> Thanks, Priya. Um, great work. Okay, we've got two more to go. So, um, so thank you all for, <laughs> for your attention today. Um, but I think you're getting a really good uh, flavor of, of the work that happens across the program. Um, and, and something we're not touching on very much in these presentations is, is how much we do work between the programs. And so, um, you know, you'll see different touch points where um, you know, you can see that uh, some of the phenotype information um, that Priya mentioned, um, you know, we need to be using data standards for that. So that's some work we're going getting on with. Um, and AI we use right across the program. And I think uh, Jürgen will be talking about that now. So Jürgen leads our biomedical informatics group, uh, very much around uh, in innovative medical technologies for the discovery of meaningful patterns and biomarkers from biomedical data. Uh, so I'll hand over to Jürgen to talk about um, his group. Thanks, Jürgen. Hello, thank you for your time. Um, my name is Jürgen Tripp. I'm group leader of biomedical informatics, um, and we're working primarily on um, medical um, imaging technologies for the discovery of meaningful patterns and biomarkers from biomedical da data. Um, and that primarily involves um, things like MRI, PET, CT, so on the top right, you can see an MR machine um, at UQ, um, where we've been doing musculoskeletal imaging, um, in particular around joints and cartilage um, with um, Professor Crozier and others. Um, and as part of our work, we usually do model fitting and quantification. So we actually try to find a way of actually generating reasonable, useful information from actual images. Um, so the purpose of our um, group is to develop imaging technologies, biomarkers, as well as statistical techniques to essentially enable precision health. Um, our aim overall is to actually get the technology deployed in clinics, hospitals, um, both using our cloud informatics platforms. Um, and we've got projects across the human lifespan from pregnancy to aging, and as well as the disease spectrum. So we've got projects within osteoarthritis, cerebral palsy, cancer and dementia, for instance. Um, and um, although it's not necessarily or only within our group, we essentially work on phenotyping and clinical data. Um, we have genomic data work with precision medicine more traditionally, as well as essentially environmental lifestyle type data. Um, but the primary focus for our group within our team is actually advanced biomarkers, whether they're fluid imaging or even digital biomarkers. Um, often our role is around harmonization and site qualification to actually um, generate nice imaging data in our cases. Um, the imaging software platforms and analysis, as well as essentially the bar statistics where you're trying to actually learn a bit from the data and see how everything relates. Um, and these are all implemented inside various technology platforms. Um, so in terms of our cap capabilities, just because of the type of um, seminar today is, um, primarily most of the staff within the group are a bit of MR physics, medical image processing, machine learning and AI, as well as a fair bit of fairly strong in mathematics modeling, as well as statistics. Um, and there is a reasonable amount of support around software engineering, whether that's in AWS and things like that. And we're trying to develop a bit more TGA regulatory um, background in terms of software as a medical device to allow us to do better translation. Um, historically, our projects have essentially been in neurodegeneration, um, Alzheimer's disease, cerebral palsy, MS, prostate cancer, and osteoarthritis to a large extent. And associated with that is a whole range of imaging modalities, which those who've done MRI, PET, CT before would probably be familiar with. Um, so our group is split into four teams. So Jason, Dr. Dowling is um, the lead of the medical image analysis team. And his um, team is primarily um, working on projects around developing, validating, and translation, new AI and ML tools. 
um, to improve disease diagnosis, treatment planning, and delivery. So for an example is from um, UQ and Children's um, Hospital, we're basically working on an MR me method to replace CT for cerebral, um, duh, 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 um, for um, ataxia. Um, and so this is done on the 3T Siemens scanners um, in, in collaboration with Siemens and Herf as well. Um, and we also have got a new project with QT around wearable ultrasound. Um, and another one is basically the more traditional um, segmentation registration type methods where we're using various deformable registrations as well as deep learning to actually do segmentation, split your anatomy up into sections, and then you can actually do monitoring and assessments. Um, our, another team within our group is um, led by Dana Bradford, and her focus is primarily on MI imaging techniques that provide enhanced information about neuropathology for improved detection and diagnosis, um, mainly for neurodevelopmental disorders and brain trauma. So we're looking at projects primarily with UQ, um, with Ros Boyd, for instance, um, where we're actually taking um, MR as well as EEG, as well as a whole suite of clinical assessments um, from people, uh, from babies who are in the ICU units. Um, so they might be assessed at 32 weeks um, post gestational age. Um, they'll also be assessed at term equivalent age, as well as longer term follow ups. And we're trying to develop essentially imaging biomarkers as well as clinical phenotypes, which will allow earlier detection and allow better interventions going forward. Um, these are um, our work essentially takes the original images and we develop essentially reporting type mechanisms, which um, hopefully will be validated as prospective biomarkers, which could be used for triaging um, treatment plans. Um, and similarly, besides structural information, we also do a lot of connectome type work. Um, Vincent Dory, who is at, based in um, Austin Health down in Melbourne, who works with Professor Chris Rowe, as well as Colin Masters, um, is leading another team which is based mainly around PET image analysis, but effectively his whole suite of portfolio is to actually do quantify brain aging, as well as develop a range of biomarkers that can actually be used to evaluate um, various subtypes of dementia, for instance, whether it's vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia, typical Alzheimer's disease, and actually have a nice well-characterized cohort. So we're involved in the Strain Imaging Biomarker Lifestyle Study, uh, um, the Strain Dementia Network, Prospective Imaging Study of Aging, and a lot of other national as well as international studies um, with a whole range of partners. And from that, we actually collect a whole range of imaging data, and his team is primarily um, leads the uh, analysis of the imaging data in particular, but also the biostatistics associated with that. So for instance, um, with um, Professor Rowe, we've been, for the last 10 years, we've been analyzing PET scans from amyloid. And basically, if you have a positive PET scan, you can basically get nice quantification through the CSRO software. And this is provided as um, biomarkers effectively for analysis. Um, we obviously have a whole suite of tools. So we have ones for normal typical atrophy. Um, if you're interested in vascular adventures or risk factors, you have the same thing for white matter hypertensies and flares. You do the same thing for microbleeds if you're interested in small vessel diseases. Um, for things like epilepsy or even other um, late stage Alzheimer's disease, we have glucose hypermetabolisms from FTG um, and similarly for tau buildups and iron concentrations. So we have a whole suite of different um, techniques around. Um, our, to round this off, we ha also have a biostatistics team, and the, this team is aimed to design and implement statistical methods to integrate essentially all the data from various streams to actually uncover a bit, essentially try and understand the complexities involved. Um, so a small example is on the right where we've actually been using um, a lot of the PET imaging modalities to actually try and validate new blood tests which are coming on for earlier detection of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is one of the new Janssen um, assays, which is a PTAL217, and we're comparing it to the amyloid PET scans. And you, I mean, standard um, diagnostic um, validation. Um, but of course, once you have those type of data, you can also do apps and risk measurement scores. And so for instance, we've got our shiny apps to actually do um, patient specific um, risk assessments, and then you can actually try and work out interventions from there if, if that's appropriate, um, for instance. Um, and just that was a short overview of everything. Um, and I just wanted to say, obviously, this is work is done by a whole range of people. And so just thanks to all of them and all the people who participated in the studies and everything else, because obviously, um, it's, yeah, a lot of work around. 
fabulous. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jürgen. Um, uh, and, and, you know, obviously some, some fabulous work there. So uh, our final talk today is from Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee comes from our health services group. Uh, Marlene, who's the group leader, is, is currently on holidays. Um, but Kaylee is more than capable of talking about the great work which her and her group do. So Kaylee, over to you. Kaylee's uh, our postdoc and uh, in particular is looking at um, how we can use some of our health services work for uh, to, to support uh, reducing the gap in Indigenous health outcomes. But today I think she'll be just be giving an overview of the, of the group. Kaylee. Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. I will keep it brief because I know I'm between us and lunch or a cup of tea. Um, so like David said, I'm here on behalf of my supervisor, Dr. Marlene Barnfield. Um, and as well, I'm also here on behalf of a really big group. So we've got people in um, Brisbane, in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth. A lot of us are really international ourselves, so we're always keen to collaborate nationally and internationally. Um, what do we do as a group? Um, as you can see by the teams there before, we've kind of got a diverse skill base, but we all have the same goal of revolutionizing health service delivery. Um, all of us are really focused on more personalized patient-centered care. Um, we want to create more cost-efficient care and convenient kind of health service experiences. So we approach this from a number of different angles. Um, the guys have touched upon the machine learning that we do. Um, we do it with our group as well, um, supporting smart diagnostics. Um, we have people that are experts in sensor technology, um, investigating sensors in the built environment and wearable devices to support clinical monitoring. Um, myself and um, my team, we work on mobile health applications and web-based platforms um, to kind of to support disease management and care coordination. So we just um, target health service delivery um, from a number of different directions. Um, one of the ways I'm, I'll just go over a few of our little projects that we've got to give you like a better example, because if you're not in the e-health space, I wasn't when I came, I'm a public health background. So learning all the terminology and vocabulary, it's a lot to get it. <laughs> um, but these guys essentially work in artificial intelligence in telehealth. And from my understanding, they're essentially using cameras to look at disease states. And then they use artificial intelligence um, to grade the condition based on established guidelines. And then that decision might get pushed on to a clinician. And then the clinician can use that um, as a decision support aid. And I think what's really special um, about some of these teams in CSIRO and the work that they do is these guys can not only work on building the screening and the cameras and the AI, but then they develop the platform um, to, and the user interface to manage the data as well. So I think that's really important to remember that we've, we've got that range of skill. And then also I think I wanted to mention because I know the TRI motto is from um, bench to bedside and we're really passionate about that as well. We have a really strong focus on co-design and the sustainability of our interventions. And we've got considerable experience um, and support from CSIRO to translate our research for the public good. So a lot of the things that we do, we're thinking you know, down the line, how is this going to um, make a difference in the real world? Um, David mentioned Smarter Saker Homes, and I will just speak about it briefly. Um, essentially sensors in a person's home, monitoring movement and behavior. That information goes to an iPad that the person in the home, their carers, their family can utilize. Um, this project has been going on for a while now and it's actually just been licensed to an Australian ASX company, um, but we still have the capacity to use this um, technology and certainly reinvent it in different ways if people have ideas. And that, that goes for everything that I mentioned today. Um, we've, you know, validated a lot of things and we're excited to, you know, turn it into something else or use it um, in a different way. Another platform um, that we regularly work off is our mobile health platform, which is one I mentioned I'm on. 
Um, it incorporates the patient facing app and then a web based clinician dashboard. And as David mentioned, the platform was validated in RCT for cardiac rehabilitation, and then it just took off. So we've um, got a number of disease specific projects, our biggest being the mother platform. Um, and essentially it's just being used to help support the management of gestational diabetes. So moms typically used to put their blood sugars into a paper-based diary um, and then have to like email it to the hospital and go in multiple times a day or multiple times a week if their sugars weren't being managed. Now they can use a Bluetooth enabled blood sugar monitor, a glucometer, put their sugars into the app and then the app talks to the portal um, and the clinicians can remotely monitor how mom's going and they can modify what kind of metrics they want to use. It can connect to different sensors and wearables and stuff like that. And I think that's what's really exciting about technology is the flexibility. So at the eHealth Center, we're really guided by patients and clinicians and researchers like yourselves that are kind of at the coalface or you guys can tell us what the problem is and then we can come in um, and join you with our expertise, which is more about implementing innovative technologies tailored to a condition or environment. So we do have some clinicians on, um, on our teams, but um, we've, we're more so interested in finding people that are working closely with something and then you know partnering up. So another way we approach mobile health is as a conduit for communication. Our teams have developed applications to support communication between culturally and linguistically diverse patients and their care providers. Um, we've done stuff where we've created something um, that clinicians can share images between each other to help um, make decisions. And it's, you know, it's safe, the, the privacy isn't an issue. Um, many of your researchers are really comfortable building technology, um, but if there's something out there that's already um, built, we won't reinvent the wheel. Um, we can use that and validate it scientifically, um, but if there isn't a solution, then we'll build it and we'll tailor it to your needs type of thing. So that's, that's really exciting. And then last but not least, um, we have people that work with robots. I just love that. I, there's a robot that sits in my cubicle and it like blinks and smiles at me and it's fantastic. Um, our group focuses on human robot interaction, human computer interaction and predictive analytics. And they've been util utilizing robots for behavior interventions and to identify and counteract physical and cognitive decline in older people, um, engaged children um, on the spectrum. And um, yeah, there's lots of applications. So again, we collaborate um, to find out where there is a need. And just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to showcase some of the skills. So we've got a lot of builder people, a lot of tech people. We've got some people people. So I'm more of a qualitative researcher, um, interested in implementation science and needs and values of, um, the people that we're working with and the people that we're working for, the patients um, and the health consumers. And um, yeah, we would welcome the opportunity to talk with you guys. I know it's a lot to take in, um, but always happy to just have a chat and see if we can explore something together. So Marlene's details are up there. Otherwise, um, yeah, be in touch. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Um... Kaylee. So, Helen, I think that's um, our presentations for the day. And I think next up, we've got a bit of a discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, David. And thanks to all of the speakers. That was just a wonderful overview of everything that's um, going on. So I might invite all of the speakers that are here in person just to come up to the um, chairs there. So, David, at this end, we'll just get a bit organised here. So. Sure. We'll, we'll open this up for a discussion amongst everybody that's here. And also I can take some questions online, I believe, if people want to put that into the chat. Um, but just while we're getting a bit sorted out, one of the important things that we need to think about is how not just people in this audience, sorry, Alan, but others in TRI and our healthcare partners who might want to link 
and collaborate with the with the CSIRO team. Um, and uh, the grants that will be at uh, hundred thousand dollar grants uh, will open on the eighth of August. So essentially, you've got almost a month to have a think about a project that you might like to. Um, you might already have one on the shelf ready to go, but what you might like to do in terms of collaborating with one of the um, uh, groups. Um, we'll absolutely, TRI will absolutely assist in, 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 in the links. Um, and Benny um, uh, Watson, who's our clinical and research translation manager, can help provide um, those links and put people together. But David, I suggest that the other way that we might do that is also to provide the contact details um, of the individual group leaders or other contact person so that you can just get on the email and start um, forming yep. those collaborations and having a chat. David? For sure. Yes, <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. So um, are there any questions, burning questions from people in the audience that would like to kick us off? If you could just introduce yourself before the question, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Konstantin Momot from QUT, and I think this is a question for Jürgen. Uh, Jürgen, you mentioned imaging biomarkers. Is your focus in that area specifically on the brain, or are you interested in other parts of the body as well? Um, we've got projects um, across the spectrum. So primarily we have a lot of neuro, so the neuro is um, covered in terms of MRI and CT. Um, but we also do um, work with UQ um, with essentially various joints. Um, we also do prostate radiotherapy. We've also got some quantification for liver. Um, and so we've got a reasonable spectrum. Um, um, we also do x-rays with um, fractures and things like that with JTI, for instance. And so there's, yeah. Breast images. We um, breast imaging we have not too much previous experience on. Um, that's primarily been done at UQ, um, but they're with ultrasound or with um, MRI. Yeah. So, but one of our uh, there's a couple of pe people we have in our team who have done that work before. So that would be of interest. Yeah. I thought I'd. Um, well, we're are we between questions, Helen? Because yeah, I, please go ahead, David. Yeah, so look, I thought one of the interesting things, and Jürgen mentioned it briefly, but um, I thought I'd just expand upon it a little bit. Um, we, we have been around for a while, and, and um, uh, the interesting thing about digital health at the moment is how more of it's being captured in change, uh, changes around regulatory approvals for software as a medical device. And, um, and then on, on, on top of that, we're seeing some of the research tools in particular coming out of Jürgen and um, uh, Jürgen's group, but, but across the program, which, which were developed to help uh, identify biomarkers, um, now, um, now the clinici clinical researchers who we're working with would like to use those tools clinically. <laughs> and so, um, so the whole, whole spectrum of, of quality management and, um, and, and regulatory approval uh, is something that we're looking at at the moment, on, uh, well, more than looking at, we've got a project underway to, 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 to put processes in place um, that will allow us to take things through for regulatory approval for uh, use clinically. So I think that's a that's a, a bit of a unique selling point for for what we're doing is is being able to um, to go through that process as well. Thanks, David. We have another question. Hi. Uh, my name is Dee. I'm an immunologist from UQ Dementina Institute. Um, I have a question, probably for uh, Eugene, but other people can also comment. Uh, I saw you have uh, show a case, uh, Rose Boy, you look at the biomarkers for brain development abnormality. So my question is, when we're looking for biomarker, how, what's the size of the normal sample we need to, to, to biomarker discovery? Associated with this question, uh, I always consider now because the big data and um, machine learning and the, the larger number of the sample sets is really helpful for uh, AI driven the discovery. Um, but there's another way is use a relatively small number of sample sets 
for discovery, but then use the other way, even some of the lab for your market validation. So leave a comments and different approach between these two. Thank you. Um, in reality, it mainly depends on the effect size. So basically it depends on how much of a signal you get between the two groups for essentially your numbers. And so that's just a standard t-test to get an idea about how many numbers you might need for a particular um, biomarker. Um, for example, in Alzheimer studies, you might do a early discovery um, cohort, which might only be 30, 30, 30 in a group. So you might have a small number. Um, second stage validation, you would still be looking around about 200 type subjects. Um, but and then you go usually into the thousands once you actually do proper validation of the biomarkers. Um, but it does very much depend on how subtle the effect is. Um, so is that sort of answering your question? Yeah. For the discovery, no, but essentially when you go into different phases for your diagnostic validation, um, initially you usually use fairly pure groups when you're evaluating, so you might take typical AD and compare it to healthy controls who are fairly well characterized to evaluate how much effect is. And then you actually go into um, comparisons with other types of say dementias or other types of um, pathologies to actually see how well you can differentiate these groups. And then the third stage is you actually see when you actually have a more normal population, when people have comorbidities or the other things that go around, how much of an effect you have. And so each of those stages, you get different sensitivity specificity, um, and but you usually there's a well-defined staging for how you actually want to progress those type of things. I wonder if I'll just check the chair's prerogative and ask the question because it leads on from um, Dee's question. So as a clinician and um, a bit of a researcher, I'm very scared of e-health because I feel like with the diseases that I look after, smaller number diseases where there isn't necessarily big data like in oncology or other spaces in trying to answer some questions like so for example if I use rheumatoid arthritis as an example you know a clinical problem for me is that now I have a patient sitting in front of me and I have a great choice of medications so an explosion in you know the biologic drugs and otherwise that I could use but actually very little decision help about the patient in front of me um, and which drug for which person would would so that prediction is not there and partly that's because pharma companies drive many of the clinical trials and then that data is not available you know big data is not available or otherwise so my question is in relation also to TRI and biomedical researchers and it speaks to numbers if you had a small project which looked at, you know, some sort of predictive model that incorporated some of the information that we have from the clinic in terms of the things that we know um, uh, in terms of demographics, clinical circumstances, their initial blood tests, those that sort of clinical data. And then we have a TRI researcher here, you know, and, and RA is a good example where we do understand some of the HLA high risk, you know, HLA. Um, risk alleles, or we understand some of the cytokine signature profiles or otherwise, can somebody help me put that together, you know, in a predictive way or, you know, using AI and machine learning? Is, is that possible? Do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, it's, it depends on the sample size. And I think we were discussing a, um, a, something about this yesterday also with one of the clinicians from here. It, it really depends on exactly what you're trying to do. But yes, you do need, so there are some statistical techniques that work very well with small and white data. And um, our approach to doing machine learnings being not to have that, let's throw everything in the machine and see what comes up. So uh, our team's sort of half made up of statisticians and half made up of AI machine learning type people. So um, really a well-considered statistical approach to making sure you've got the right sample size and what you're doing um, is yeah. is sort of uh, robust and statistically valid um, is, is the first conversation we need to have. But we shouldn't be scared about having that conversation with you if we don't have a big preset data, you know, set. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you.
Hi, I'm Arita from UQ Diamantina. Um, I wanted to ask Priya a question, great data set you showed on, on the SARS-CoV-2 work. Um, sort of low-hanging fruit markers of disease severity. Have you looked sort of beyond that and, and potentially, you know, drug efficacy, um, dexamethasone is given in, in sort of the um, sort of severe setting. There's no clear indication why dex works um, sort of in that space. And also not just the mutational data. Have you thought about looking at the transcriptional uh, data too? We've, we've got sort of extensive data in, 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 in transcriptional signatures of, of disease severity, and we're trying to look beyond that at the moment. It'll be interesting to see um, how that maps out to the mutational data. No, that's a really good question. So with uh, dextamethasone, um, there is some evidence showing that mutations in NSP14 do modulate that um, response, but I think that we will need enough data, I guess, to have the patients that have responded, and yeah, we'll have to use that data. And I, yeah, I don't know anything about the transcriptional um, data that you're talking about, but that's really interesting. We would love to incorporate like RNA signatures into our prediction models as well. That would be really, really cool collaboration. Yeah. Just while we're moving on, if there's anybody online, if you do want to pop a question into the chat function or otherwise, I'm I'm happy to read any questions out. But we've got someone else in line. And yeah. Better? Okay. Hello, my name is Surska Arnatowska. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow and a psychologist at Faculty of Medicine, working closely with um, Professor Dan Siskin in the area of more severe and persistent mental illness. Um, first of all, thank you all very much, um, David and Michael and everyone. It's been great to hear the diversity and the depth and scope of the work that you do. We're currently um, proposing some of the e-health um, tools for this population, but I guess for the purposes of this um, getting together seminar and the upcoming grant, I'm curious about the scope of projects that we can propose with you, um, since some ideas that we have are quite big, large, and would probably not fit, but I'm wondering whether a small pilot testing something that has been um, like an, um, a mobile app trialed in general population and look, seeing whether it is feasible in our specific group is then too small, or is that a kind of a focus of the grant to get something that can have a potential for upscaling of the ground? Thank you. Or who would be a... <laughs> I think I might, mm -hmm. can you guys hear me? Is that all right? Yep. Um, I'll let the big boss jump in, but I think certainly we would be from a kind of mobile health application. We do have, like I mentioned, we've got some established platforms that we could riff off and do some sort of pilot thing. Um, so little is good to start out with um, in the e-health space particularly. and. Um, yeah, we can just have a chat and see where it could go and what sort of funding we would need. If, mm -hmm. And I think that is our challenge. If we have to build something brand new, then we do need a bigger grant right. and we need um, yeah. money to pay our engineers to develop it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, look, so so um, we, we've kind of, we, we had a quantum of money um, and, and this was from CSIRO a number of years ago and, and then um, matched by TRI. The grant does have to cover both CSIRO and, and, and the TRI researchers' um, uh, costs, so, you know, as per our normal processes with both uh, CSIRO and, and TRI members. So I think, um, I, I think, um, you know, it'll be a, I, you know, it's probably a bit on the small side for now, but it's about initiating something and then looking to see where, where we can take it. So, yeah. Great, thank you. We'll get in touch. Excellent. Any other questions, Graham? I suppose picking up, it, up on that, David, and some of the earlier comments were made, uh, we've got some pilot data that demonstrates there might be some value in that. Uh, currently, we analyze manually, and it's uh, a time-consuming, but also can be somewhat subjective. So we'd be keen in, in looking at 
technologies, and this is image data again in, in getting better analysis, but then obviously that's then got to be validated, um, which probably means acquiring some more data. So how far can we go down that pathway of, of developing the analytical tools and then demonstrating and potentially actually, you know, we've got some uh, interventions in mind that we want to try uh, to see whether it's actually the intervention works as well as whether the technology works. Excellent. Yep, happy to have those discussions, Graham. Are there any other questions? Because we're very close to one o'clock and we have lunch outside. So it would be really lovely if everybody who's able to, uh, wanted to come and have some lunch and then these guys will be available to have a chat to. Um, the most important thing just in closing, I think, is that, you know, this is to drive some collaboration um, uh, and, and we'd love to see um, uh, those links formed. Um, if we can assist in any way, um, we'll be putting a lot more promotion around the place and sending out emails and otherwise to contact Benny and we'll provide the details all of the CSIRO groups so that you can directly link in. But please start thinking about that. The grants will open, as I mentioned, on the 8th of August, and there'll be further detail there. So um, it leaves me to thank David and all of our speakers for a really fantastic um, hour and a half. It was excellent. Um, David, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, I'd just simply say thanks for coming along and, and, uh, and hearing what we've had to say. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what we can initiate with uh, TRI. And, and I'll add that... Um, uh, we collaborate really strongly uh, here in, in Queensland, um, as we do increasingly around Australia, but um, are very keen to make sure we're doing more, more here in Brisbane. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.